Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here this morning. Welcome to you on this first Sunday in June. Normally, this would be Communion Sunday on the first Sunday, but I didn't think I was going to be here today. Uh, obviously, I am. Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to serve Communion next Sunday. Uh, just for those of you who would um, uh, make a special point to be here on Communion Sunday, we'll do that uh, next uh, Sunday. Uh, forgive us for the scaffolding, as you can tell. There's uh, plastering and painting going on in the church to cover up some of the water spots. Uh, and we just told the contractors to leave the, um, uh, leave the scaffolding up until they get completely done with it. And so for those of you who are rooted out of the back row, forgive us. Uh, for those of you on this side who are still in the back row, we forgive you. Uh, uh, for, uh, hanging out back there. Uh, it's great to see everybody as we come together to worship. Let's pray together, shall we? Oh, Lord, we give you thanks for today and for the blessings we receive during the course of this day and we will receive by the power of your Holy Spirit as we move through this worship together. Grant us, O oh Lord, the favor of that Spirit to encourage us in our worship. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to sing an old familiar hymn, Rock of Ages. I'm going to ask that you stand as you're able and join as we sing Rock of Ages. Join as we sing the glory of pottery, giving um, glory to our Lord. Let's sing. seated. We're going to pray together, uh, and we'll begin by praying silently, uh, and I encourage you to lift up those that you know who need our prayers. I'm particularly grateful today for um, uh, all of our high school seniors who graduated in the rain and the storms uh, over this past week, especially I'm grateful that my granddaughter graduated yesterday, to which you may say amen. 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 We say it big time at our house, let me tell you. Uh, my wife told me, I shouldn't tell all these stories on my wife. She's not here to protect herself. But uh, she, uh, she gladly announced yesterday she's never, ever going to have to ask again, have you got your homework done? It's a good thing uh, at, at our house. Let's pray together, shall we?
Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks today for your great blessings. Particularly, we thank you today for those who have been given a sense of renewal in life by the discovery of something new and wondrous for them in your love and in your grace and in your creation. We give you thanks for those who've been made joyous by the experience of being wanted and needed. And for those whose gifts have been gladly received. But we also pray today, O oh God, for those who have trouble in life. Trouble expressing how they feel. Troubled by uncommunicated anger. Troubled by guilt unoffered for forgiveness. We pray for those who have tried to communicate lovingly only to have words and gestures come out all wrong and be terribly misunderstood. We pray for those among us today, O oh Lord, troubled with a sense that the years have gained on them unfairly and that momentum in their lives have been taken from them. We pray for those who find themselves in situations that are abrasive and, yes, even mean-spirited. For those who are in conflict with others and, therefore, that the joys of work or home or school or being a neighbor have turned to wearisome bitterness or even a dull hopelessness. We pray today, O oh Lord, for those stabbed by sorrow, whose hearts have been made heavy by disappointment, and for those who have grown weary in well-doing, caught up in the uncertainty and doubts that have followed the making of decisions, whose energies have been drained by wishing for what cannot be. We particularly pray today, O oh Lord, for those who are infected with the desire for getting even, even when they have been despitefully used. And so today, O oh Lord, in the midst of that sense of your presence and power in our lives, we give you thanks for coming out of a period of uncertainty and mist and fog and to the clarity and sunshine of your love, we give you thanks that the gripping ache of sorrow has been broken by your love and the promise of new life in you. In all these things, O oh Lord, we pray. In the name of our Lord Jesus, whose life and death and resurrection gives us hope for whatever lies ahead, the same Jesus, who has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. You know, it's a good thing that people remind me of what I'm supposed to be doing other than my wife. <laughs> receive these gifts which we offer to you and bless them to your service. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.
For 707, Hymn of Promise, uh, I'm going to ask that you stand as you're able and let's join and sing together Hymn of Promise. Let's sing. Death, a resurrection, at the last a victory. 
won't you be seated? I prayed for some time now of how I might um, end up my time with you all um, and what I would like to say uh, as um, Sean prepares to come and be your pastor. Uh, the office, my office has begun to look more like a pastor's office because Sean's moved his books in uh, and uh, when I look up I see somebody's books other than mine which is always interesting to see. Uh, but he's on his way and I'm on my way to being done uh, spending this time with you all. I've decided to spend these last uh, few weeks together preaching from one text, only one text. Uh, and so this is a text I hope that you all are familiar with. Uh, it is uh, called the Beatitudes, part of the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. And I'm going to be reading today from the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, if you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew 5, this is Matthew 5, 1 to 12, and I'll read this every Sunday throughout this month. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way they were persecuted, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of our Lord, and we are respond, thanks be thanks. to God. Thanks for God. Amen. Be to God. Well, yesterday I sat in a football stadium at 9 o'clock in the morning with the heat and humidity and the mosquitoes and uh, thousands of other people who gathered to watch 440 graduates of Kingwood Park High School. Um, they normally have those, uh, those graduation ceremonies inside, but given the realities of COVID in this past year, they had planned for a long time to have the graduation take place outside. They had the football field arranged uh, in safe spaces, uh, you know, can spaced apart so that the graduates sat from, the, uh, from one end zone all the way to the other end zone because our granddaughter's name begins with W. Uh, she's gone accustomed to being last. Uh, <laughs> and so she was on the next to the last row and had to wait through uh, all those other folks who went before her uh, whose names were more conveniently located at the beginning of the alphabet. Anytime I walk into a football stadium, I'm reminded uh, of certain kinds of, of things in life, and I thought uh, long and hard about what I was going to say uh, today, uh, even yesterday. I had an interesting experience this week uh, prior to this. We were getting ready, or my wife was getting ready for a big party yesterday as we celebrated Madeline's graduation. Lots of folks were coming over, and I volunteered to do her Saturday's chores, which is to take her mother to the beauty shop. I'm trying to recall when I've ever been in a beauty shop, but um, I can't recall. It was an interesting experience and full of interesting smells, uh, not unlike some of the smells you smell right now, uh, but a little bit different. But uh, it was a fascinating time. Uh, there was lots of, uh, lots of talking in a beauty shop, um, not as much as my barber shop, uh, and the conversation was different, but nonetheless... Uh, it was an interesting thing. The most interesting thing was getting my mother-in-law and my father-in-law into the car to the beauty shop and in the door. And my father-in-law, who has um, uh, lost all peripheral vision, can only see straight in front of him. He's 95 years old. And he's reached that point in life where stumbling becomes real easy for him. Always sure-footed, nonetheless, he is now stumbling along. 
as he walks. My mother-in-law, who recently fell and broke her hip, okay, is on a walker. And then there's me, who's trying to get them to the place they need to be. Now, at my age, I'm not as sure-footed as you can see, nor clear thinking, as you know, as I once was, <laughs> but nonetheless, I was trying to get her into that door. And I was just observing this. We stumbled along. Did y'all ever stumble? I mean, even sure-footed folk out there stumble, okay? I was reminded as I walked them up the ramp, her on her walker, me trying to hold on both of them, if I allowed them to fall, my wife would never speak to me again. So I, I was trying to hold on to them and make sure they got in the door safely. They did. My mother-in-law got her hair done. We sat and watched all this and then came back out and went on our way, stumbling along. I thought yesterday how much that's like who we are as Christians as we stumble toward our eventual goal as Christians, which is eternal life that begins now in the promised land that the Lord has promised us. And we do stumble, friends. We trip, we fall. There are things that occur in life that are hard. I know in, in Port Natchez Groves, that the big rival at P&G is Nederland. I have to be reminded of this, who's, who's rivals. 55 years ago, okay, the big rival of my high school, Baytown Sterling, was Baytown Lee. We had just opened Sterling High School. The two high schools were playing their first game. We celebrated uh, five years ago the 50th anniversary of the first game between those two schools. And I was invited to come as part of that team. That's interesting to go back and see the guys that were once young and were no longer that way. For we too, athletic, strong, some of us fast, most of us not, stumbled along as we walked. I walked alongside um, the quarterback of that team, who was the only one of us who went on to play college ball. Okay. I walked along the quarterback. I was the offensive guard that got him killed on more than one occasion as he played, okay? And we stumbled in. The victims, or victors, as the case may be, of age and decrepitude as we walked. Now, five years have passed, and I've not gotten any younger since that time. And I find myself stumbling, like you, even toward the promised land, stumping my toe along the way. There are hundreds of thousands, millions of Christians in the world who today are stumbling, bumbling, hobbling toward the promised land, often stumping our toe, doing things wrong, making huge mistakes, caught in our own sin, our pride, our excessive pride, too often. It is the Beatitudes that teach us how to stumble, how to overcome our stumbling toward that promised land. And so I wanted to talk about the Beatitudes as a whole today, and then over the next three Sundays, describe each of the Beatitudes in turn and what it says about who we are as a people. Years ago, I heard a lecture on the Beatitudes given by a Dutch theologian who described the Beatitudes in this way. He said, first of all, the Beatitudes, these words of Jesus are a portrait of Jesus himself, not the only portrait of Jesus, but it's a summary of the qualities that Jesus possessed as he walked among us in life. A summary of qualities that only were perfected in Jesus himself, the man from Nazareth. These Beatitudes, which sounds so quaint to us, are a description of the life that Jesus lived and that Jesus proclaims to us. They hold together only in him. 
Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who mourn. What kind of words are those? They only hold together in Christ. For none other than Jesus has been so humble, so gentle, so merciful, so pure, so compassionate, and so loyal to God's cause of love and truth. When I think about my own life, I sometimes despair that I am so far from those qualities as I live. But the Beatitudes are more than just a portrait of who Jesus is. The Beatitudes are a portrait, too, of the church as it should be. Now, let me say that as well as I can. This is a portrait of what this church ought to look like, of what you ought to be together as a community of faith. Now, you can only be what the Beatitudes pretend or recommend to us or call us to obey by the grace of God. You cannot do it on your own. Only by the power of the Holy Spirit, as it lives and moves among you, can this be lived out. You are called to be holy, the faithful body of Christ in the world. We are called to continue the work of our Lord under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. People, I don't have to tell you how imperfect you are. Okay? I don't have to tell you how imperfect any church is. We imperfectly embody the whole concept of holiness in life. But we do pray. We do pray as a church for a greater perfection. And we pray for strength to imitate Jesus in worship and in service. I pray for this church and will continue to pray for the church that you might be a holy example of what the Lord commands us to do out in the world, to be that body of loving and faithful people who commend to others the values of the kingdom of God itself. There's a final way, I think, in which the Beatitudes need to be proclaimed in our lives. They are a portrait of who Jesus is, they are an embodiment of what the church ought to be. And the Beatitudes themselves is a portrait of the life that I want to live. It's a portrait of a Christ-centered life. Again, I thought about all those graduates and their hopes and dreams as they walked down, I started to say walked down the aisle, as they walked across the yardage markers at the football field yesterday. Young people full of life and full of hope. I prayed that their stumbling would not be so great that it would end them in a point of despair. But instead, they might stumble and receive the forgiveness that God wishes to offer them in Jesus Christ. The Beatitudes themselves are a portrait of what I would like them and me and you to be. Now, I will tell you, achievement, perfect achievement of this model is impossible. Okay? It is impossible to live fully in this way, short of the very kingdom of God. It is unthinkable on my own to do these things. I cannot accomplish what the Lord calls me to do in the Beatitudes. It's difficult enough with grace. Without it, it would be wholly impossible. My inclination to sin is enormously strong. And I bet yours is too. Unless you're further along in your walk toward holy perfection than I am. Blaise Pascal, the philosopher, said this. He said, vanity is as abundant as all the tones of the voice. All ways of walking, coughing, blowing the nose, sneezing, Pascal said. Vanity, pride, which accompanies me at every step of the way. But still, here are the Beatitudes. Here they are. We can't get around them. The brush marks of holiness in our walk with Christ. They're impossible to ignore, and they are surely virtues that we want to imitate as Christians. I spoke early about wobbling and stumbling along the way. Sometimes, in order to really talk about these beatitudes and to get around them, some Christians project all this totally into the future. 
by saying, this doesn't apply to us now. It's only in a future kingdom that they'll only be fulfilled historically or spiritually in some way or both. But the tenses of the verbs here state it clearly. Not blessed will be, not blessed could be, but blessed what? Y'all help me? Are. The tense is we are all called to this. We cannot just project this into the, some future state, but recognize that we're called to it now. Now, these blessings are designated by Jesus, pointed by Jesus, directly to his disciples in the Sermon on the Mount. And the form that comes by Jesus is exclamation. You are, these are joy-filled words that he says. You are my disciples, Jesus says. You are special. And my disciples, the ones who follow me, are poor in spirit and gentle and merciful. They are the ones, that's right, you people are the ones who make for peace in the world. We are pure in heart, called to be pure. We mourn over the sins and troubles of the world. And yes, we might even be willing to suffer for the sake of our Lord. Now these are exclamatory statements. They're not soft. They can't be soft pedaled. They are shouted from the housetop by Jesus. Now it's curious how all this gets translated from Greek to English. The traditional Greek to English translation of this announcement says, blessed are. That's an odd word, blessed are. And one we don't use too much in everyday conversation. Several recent translations of the Beatitudes put it differently. They've changed blessed to other exclamatory words that have a deeper and more forceful meaning for us. Sometimes it gets translated as happy. Okay. Happy are those who mourn. Strange words indeed, is it? Happy are the poor in spirit. William Barclay, in his popular Bible study series from years ago, translated it another way, which I like a lot. He says, this ought to be translated, oh, the bliss, oh, the wonder, oh, the joy of being these things. In the phrases that are quoted at the top of each of these Beatitudes, blessed are, there's another word that could be used. It's a word that uh, I think is much better than happy and indeed is better than blessed. A looser translation, but nonetheless, one that I like. You might translate it as holy are those. Holy are you when you live in this way. Now, the Greek word there that's translated is the word makarios. It's translated in a traditional way in this Hebrew word blessed, but it ought to be more bright than that. It ought to be fuller of joy. These virtues that sometimes are judged to be quaint and beyond us when compared to the light of the world, the newer translations attempt, as I said, to restore it with a word like happy, bright, up, upbeat, that sort of thing. But it's a poor choice because happy is a word that we use frivolously in our own language. Here, these words, makarios is meant to be the highest joy, the greatest happiness that we can have. I hope you get that today. I hope you get the notion that when Jesus preaches, blessed are and calls us to that life, it is a life that he calls us to pure happiness and joy in life. As I preach over these next few weeks, I'll be lifting each one of these Beatitudes in turn and talk about how it can help fulfill the goals in your life, both your personal goals and your spiritual goals as well. This is a commendation from our Lord of how we ought to live as Christians, how the church ought to be, how Jesus was as he lived and died and rose again. There was another thing that I thought about as I walked on that football field yesterday. Football fields bring back happy memories and they bring back some odd senses. Okay? Every August, when August rolls around, uh, I'm, I'll be 71 in August, and I remember like yesterday walking on a football field in August during two-a-days and the smell of newly mown grass 
indicates to me that pain is coming in some way. Okay? <laughs> it, 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 it's an odd feeling uh, to have that happen, that pain is on its way and hard work and sweat and all kinds of things. At the beginning of uh, my senior year, I was an offensive guard, okay? a bad one. But because we were few in number okay, and not so hardy in size, I was the starting left guard for our football team whose quarterback, I mentioned earlier, often got killed because of my mistakes. Okay? One day, we were playing the Brazosport Exporters. Does Port Nature's Graves ever play Brazosport? I don't know. Okay. It, it became um, uh, uh, Lake Jackson, what, uh, whatever school that is now, Lake Jackson, but it was Brazosport then. Mm -hmm. Every Saturday, we were called together as a team to replay um, the game from the night before. They always had somebody filming the game, and we watched the film from the night before. It was the opportunity to be screamed at by our coaches. Okay? Our head coach was an old Marine, and he lived that out uh, on the football field as well. Great guy, loved him, but he was a Marine. Saturday morning comes, the night before, okay, uh, as we played, our quarterback, in the process of getting hit by somebody I'm sure I let through, threw an interception to a Brazosport cornerback who proceeded to run it back for a touchdown. All of this played out on the film. There's a, a, a picture of me um, in our annual from 1968 running alongside the guy that intercepted the ball. Okay. This was also on the film. Okay. Just running along beside him. Okay. The coach, when he saw this, turned and said to me, Welch, whatever you do, just hit somebody. Okay? <laughs> Can't you just hit somebody as you run along? Yeah. My last word I want to say to you today is this. As you run along in life, stumbling toward the promised land, attempting to live out the life which Christ calls you to as an individual and as the church, for God's sakes, hit somebody, okay? <laughs> hit the marks that are set before you in these Beatitudes. Blessed are you. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the compassionate, the merciful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Blessed are those who mourn. Oh, the joy of following the Lord into that place where we stand beside those who hurt in life. Friends, hit somebody. Hit the mark set before us by our Lord. I say all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and you may say, Amen. 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 Let's pray. Oh, Lord, God, and direct us as we press toward the promised land as we hobble and stumble along. Call us to a new life in you that brings us the greatest joy in life. The greatest joy in being those holy people who hit the mark set before us in these Beatitudes. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Friends, we're going to affirm our faith with the words to the Apostles' Creed. It's printed on the screen. Would you stand as we make this our affirmation? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From this he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the invitation that I would give to you today as individuals and as the church.
as we stumble through life, making mistake after mistake, as we stumble along the way, living our lives not in holiness but in sin, I pray that we might realize that the deepest joy, the deepest happiness, the ability to say, oh, the wonder, the bliss, the joy of, comes in following the Lord. And you can only know that by doing it. That's the only way you can know. I pray that we might all be those following after Christ who hit the mark laid before us by him. If there are those of you here today who would follow Christ, who would receive him as your Savior, trust him as your Lord, or those, those of you here today who'd like to be part of our community of faith, I invite you to come. I'll pray with you here uh, this morning as we sing together. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, okay? I bet you don't even need words for this. Let's sing it, okay? Peace out. 